don't even say those words. Yeah, we're not putting it out Are there. we live? Wonderful. <laughs> Hello, everybody. We're just saying we all need to stay healthy. Um, my name is Elise Hatton. Welcome to Hub Live. It's Thursday just after one, and I'm coming live to you from the Smart Hub and on this very rainy and wet day in Rocky. Um, of course, we do these Hub Lives uh, to encourage you to adopt modern best business practice and technology so you can grow your business, grow your profit, have a better experience of being in business. And every week I talk to an expert about all of our different topics that we've mapped out for the year. And I'll get to the topic in a moment. But first, I want to introduce you to the absolutely amazing Natalie Nichols. How are you? I'm great, Elise. Great to be back in Rocky, helping out Yay! with the Turbo Attraction Lab. Yes, let's mention that. Um, this uh, Hub Live is sponsored by the Turbo Attraction Lab. Natalie is actually one of our experts in the Turbo Attraction Lab, and she has traveled to Rockhampton from where are you based again, Natalie? Gold Coast. Gold Coast. Gold Coast um, and helping people with project management and digital marketing and technology in general. Yeah, just generally getting startups up and running and making things happen, getting some uh, dollars through the, through the door, basically. That is so good. Hey, so, so, so good. Tell us a little bit about your background. What have you done to bring you, to make you the expert that you are? Well, I've had an interesting background. My, my Education is actually business mm -hmm. with a major in both human resource management and marketing. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I and like us into today's topic. But what did you do after, <laughs> after uni? I ended up in IT. Well, the first thing I did was I set up a consulting company because that's what you do when you leave uni, right? <laughs> <laughs> so course. I guess that was the entrepreneurial spirit coming out right then. But um, I ended up by a couple of things in high-end IT. So I spent a lot of time... Um, working with government and corporates on building large-scale um, projects. That were back, back in the day when every project was monolithic and had a budget of about $80 million. And um, I've built hosting businesses, I've done pure consulting work in the tech space, and then a few years back I decided to take that tech knowledge that I had and combine it with marketing. Um, and I started to actually um, market my own products online. So that's how it sort of got me back into the digital marketing. And um, I love the space. Having that tech background is really, really helpful because it makes um, the whole tech component not daunting. And being able to apply the latest in digital practices is great for getting an outcome for not only my own products, but also the people that I work with. So yeah, I love the space. It's that great. is awesome. And of course, you've worked with teams, in teams and lead teams along the way. And you have the background in HR, right? So today's topic really is all about team. But what I'm hoping we can do is we can roll some of your tech and marketing um, knowledge into how to manage teams and why to manage teams and how to recruit teams, both onshore and offshore and so forth. So as I've mentioned uh, before, in the last few weeks, I've been saying we surveyed our community at the end of last year. And we essentially asked one question, which was, what is the greatest challenge that you are facing in your business today that you think is preventing you or that you need to master to take your business to the next level? And we got some really great feedback. And the first thing that people said that they were struggling with was really around the time management productivity mm -hmm. side of things, which is why we devoted all of February to talking about that specific topic. But new month, yes. new topic. So <laughs> the it. second thing, nice. The second thing that people, um, that our community uh, nominated as their biggest challenge was all around managing, recruiting, and working leading teams. And that is our theme for March. And Natalie, you have a lot of experience mm -hmm. in this. In fact, I know that you're working a little bit with US-based companies on offshoring their teams and so forth. So we have a lot to talk about sure. today. So let's start with when should you go? If you're a person who started a business, when should you go to employing your very first employee? Well, this is actually something that most people make a mistake of, was when you're, um, when you're out there, and look, I've been guilty of this, and I think every entrepreneur has as well, is that um, <clears throat> when you're out there trying to get your business up and running, and you're trying to keep cash really tight to start off with, basically what you do is you end up doing everything as the, the solepreneur to start off with. And what in fact you, you end up working crazy hours every week, you know, 80, 100 hours are not unheard of for, for solopreneurs starting out. And in actual fact, what you end up doing is working in the business, not on the business. Mm. So you do everything from sweep the floor or, or you know, 
you're the help desk, the you're, waste the, you're, the, you're the help desk, you're, mm. you're the product development, you're everything. And so really it comes down to, it becomes down to a financial point of view as well, but you have to look at the processes that you've got running in your business. What is an easy repeatable process that you can then look at carving out? You also have to look at whether you need some certain tech skills or whether you need some certain innovation or um, creativity that, you, that is going to lead your company to um, the, next, the next sort of step. It could be that you actually need a salesperson to out there on the, on the ground making sales. So depending upon the business, you have to be very, very aware of the different sorts of um, areas where you can easily carve out and say, there is an area that perhaps I'm not so good at. Also look at that because um, as founders, we often go to areas just because we can doesn't mean we should. Mm. And um, you know we all fall into that trap occasionally. So I have to sit back very much and say no. Just because I can build that, so that funnel doesn't mean that it's the best use of my time. What, the, what other people can't do is come up with the actual design of, say, um, a marketing funnel. So therefore, I'm best to do the design and outsource the actual building of that or mm. get somebody in to build that. And these are the critical thinking steps that you are challenged with when you're an entrepreneur. And you have to know what your own skill set is and very, very be very comfortable what your own skills are, what you like doing and what you're good at. And sometimes they don't actually align. And you have to say, what can I easily pass off to somebody else that's going to help me move the business forward? Mm. Did I answer that or go Yeah, around? no, I think you answered that really, really well. Hey, Caleb, Leah, Derek, thank you so much for joining us on our Hub Live today. I get so excited when you guys join us. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Please hop on and ask Natalie or myself a question. Well, today's topic is all around team and really building a team. So the first question we've asked is, when do you know you should, be, you should build your team? And really the answer is you should do some critical analysis around your own skill set, also around your own like dollar value of your time, and then you should look at what is needed in the business for you to grow this business quickly. Because really there is absolutely no point if you are the person um, I'm going to use a really um, not good example, but if you're the person, you know, cleaning, spending 10 hours a week cleaning the office when you really should be the person spending 10 hours a week selling your goods and services. Finding new customers. Finding new customers. And then if you are the person using that 10 hours to clean your, clean your office, you need to really seriously think about not doing that. So you need someone to And that's the difference between being you. busy and being productive too. It's <clears> easy to do things because they need to be done, but do they actually add to moving that business forward or do they actually add to the bottom line? Absolutely. Probably a lot of things that you're doing don't. So it's really critically looking at the activities of your business and saying, what do I really need to keep here and what can I perhaps move out? Do you know what I love to do? Hey, Katie Joy, thank you so much for joining us. Um, I love to do um, a time trial. So what that means is you just write down, for a whole week, you write down every 15 minutes what you're spending your time on. <laughs> and scary. that is going to be the most scariest thing that you'll look at if you can get yourself to do it. Mm -hmm. And then you can really go, well, how much of my time did I spend marketing, selling, and delivering great customer service? And what else did I do, which was really someone else's job yes. that I was doing? And look... Everybody starts out this way because, you know, very few people are fortunate enough to have a whole bundle of cash where they can go and mm. float a business and have, you know, the right people in the right jobs to start off with. Mm. So um, it's, it's all about the growing pains that you get there. And the people that really can transcend from this position to when they start to build out their teams, they're the people that are going to be successful. The sooner you can get to the point where you're working full time on your business rather than in it, um, that's going to be more than likely somebody that's going to be successful very quickly. So when you are you know, building your team, we obviously have a number of different options that we can go. So one thing that I know is that, or kind of the theory, the rule of thumb is, if you're hiring someone in your business, so you are employing someone to work in your business for you full time, the cash flow rule of thumb is, if you're making enough cash flow to cover half of that person's wage, that's when you, that's the trigger for hiring someone. And then the, the person added to your team really should be making up the other half of their wage plus a bit of profit. So that could be an easy, but that's when you hire someone to work in your business. But there are other options, aren't they, Natalie? The, the, what are the so other now. options? Well, we, we live in such a, a global market now, and we also have a very, very flexible economy. 
And certainly what the trend is, is that more and more people aren't actually working for an employer full time. And so what we're seeing is that there is a lot of high end skills, a lot of very competent people, but they may not necessarily be right here in this building or in this town or in this state or even this country. So um, as much as I really love to employ Australians wherever possible, um, and I'm a big exponent of that, the reality is that it's not always the most effective way to grow your team or grow your business. I think as individuals, we really need to think about the fact that we now operate in a global economy mm -hmm. and therefore our workforce has to follow suit with that. I've actually been doing a lot of work in virtual, um, uh, virtual offices and that sort of stuff since about 2008. I was actually one of the first people to have virtual teams. Oh, wow. That's so amazing. I actually put the, the, you know, back in the day when I was doing software, I was one of the first people that had virtual systems in uh, Microsoft technologies for setting up remote um, staff. So, yeah, that's just another lifetime ago. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how do we do that? Let's talk about the different options. So the first option is the obvious one, which is hire an Australian person, hire lo a local person to come and work in your office with you. Mm -hmm. And as I said, if your cash flow can cover half of that wage, that's kind of the trigger of when and you, you should And you probably want to have three on. months worth of spare cash behind you in case things don't take off as it, quick as you think. So exactly. good rule of thumb, but I'd also just add that you probably want to have a little bit of a buffer of say three months expenses in your back pocket. Awesome. Okay, so what do we do? What the hiring tips and tricks, recruitment tips and tricks, should I say, do we have around building our team, like getting someone local to come and join your team? Yeah, so um, the first place that most people go today looking for employment is Seek. Um, that seems to be the seek.com .au is the, the biggest uh, employment engine in Australia. But it's not necessarily um, going to be the, um, the best fit for your job either. So um, LinkedIn is another great place to put out to your local network to say, hey, I'm looking for this, this sort of person. But taking a step back from that, be very clear about the sort of person that you're actually looking for. Take some time to put together a proper job description. Understand what it is that you want those, that person to play. And also be very clear in your mind that this person's probably going to have to wear multiple hats at the beginning. When you're a small team or it's a second in, in, uh, in second hire in a business, then generally the founder and the second hire are going to wear multiple hats. So straight away that tells you the sort of person that you're going to need to hire. They may not be the best at the particular thing that you want, but if they've got the ability to be flexible and they don't mind change and they, they're okay living in a little bit of uncertainty, that sort of personality traits that you want to couple with that person's actual uh, skill set, and they're the sort of person that you want to hire. So bear that in mind when you're starting to look for the person that you want. Um, when you're starting with small businesses or startups, the world's very uncertain, processes change, things are fast moving. So keep all of those things in mind, because if you've got somebody that's very rigid in their way and what they do, and that they're used to coming out of maybe, say, a corporate environment, maybe they're not going to be such a great fit. You may get the odd one, but um, you've just got to keep these things in mind. So LinkedIn, um, seek.com.au is another great place. Check out social media, um, your local Facebook and even Instagram for, for people that are out there. I mean, I know a lot of businesses that are successfully hired just by putting out a post on their Facebook and their Instagram to say, we're hiring, this is what we need. Be a little bit creative too about the sort of person that you want. Get them excited by your business and your vision and what you want them mm -hmm. to do and what you want them to deliver and the team that you're trying to build. When you decide to come and, you know, when you, when you first decide you're going to go and work with somebody, half the job is about not just the pay, it's about the fact that you, you want to work with somebody that's energetic, they've got a great vision, and you, you're looking for that personality fit more so at the beginning than you'll, you'll find further on down the track. Mm. Because there's no point in coming to work and knowing that I've just hired somebody and their personality really grates on me. But by the same token, you don't want to hire yourself either. I see a lot of people make that mistake. They actually go and hire themselves. And so you've got two of the same person in the one business when in actual fact you need complementary skill sets. Mm, absolutely. Karen, Tamara, thank you so much for joining us. I'm obviously here with the incredible Natalie and we're talking about how to build teams, when to build teams and how to build teams. Tamara's made a really great comment. Do you want to um, tell us what it is and, and elaborate on it maybe? Of course. 
Um, when we're creating, creating businesses, one of the things that we're really, really big on at the beginning is the why. Why are we in business? What is our bigger vision? What are we setting out to do? It's got to be more than just the business. We're not just transacting a service or a product. We want people to buy into the whole vision of our business and what we're taking that to and how we're going to put that on a global stage. And ideally, when we're looking at businesses, how are we going to look at potentially a, you know, a multi-million, hundred million, you know, billion dollar exit. So that sort of thinking up front and portraying that picture to a potential employee is certainly going to help with the vision that you're setting out to, um, to embrace, to market, and um, basically to um, encourage people to come along, not only for your products, but also as part of the team and the culture that you're going to build moving forward. It's, it's, it's one thing to have a great product and service. It's also another thing for a business to say, we are an employer of choice because people love working with us because they love the vision and the mission that we've put forward. Mm -hmm. So really, if you as a business owner are able to communicate really clearly what the why is, instead of having to go and chase good employees, you attract them and they come to you and they say, I want to be part of this thing that you are building. Yes. And you, then you know there's a good fit. Yeah, And sure. then if they fit the culture, which we'll talk about in a, in a little while, then you know that it's going to be a smooth sailing moving Well, you forward. hope so. Well, <laughs> well as hopefully smooth <laughs> as it can possibly be. Not smooth, smooth, because this is real life. Yeah. I keep saying that, right? It's so this is real life. This is um, th things don't always go according to plan. Even when you do things perfectly, things still. But you that's know, half the fun, isn't it? Exactly. That's why we're problem solvers. Okay. So um, that's recruiting people in your business who are local. What can we? What else can we do? We have a couple of other avenues. What if we want to work with, say, advisors or consultants still local or still in Australia? Mm -hmm. So how um, do we go it's, about it's become a very um, a very common way to employ people of late. Um, in fact, all of my life, I think I've only been a full-time employee for one year mm. of my whole career. The rest of the time I was a consultant or I was a contractor. So basically that's another option. There's a lot of people out there that are quite happy to work a couple of days a week in your business and that may be a really good option because maybe you're not quite ready to get a full-time person in but you want somebody that's got a higher level of experience. Typically you'll pay a little bit more for those sort of people but um, by the same token, then it gives you a, some other hiring um, flexibility and you can say, well, let's start out at two days a week or one day or three days or whatever might suit. And you're getting them with that, uh, an added level of experience. The other things that you may also need to think about as you're putting your business together is getting a great accountant, a great um, a lawyer. Um, these sorts of people are going to be able to provide awesome advice as you move forward mm -hmm. and make sure you don't fall into any nasty traps that you may have overlooked or um, you know, just not been aware of. You don't know what you don't know when you're starting out with businesses, particularly if this is your first new business. I see this a lot with people. They don't realise that, hey, I've got to account for money for, for GST and stuff like that. There's lots of simple things that... Um, these sorts of people can help you to make sure you don't fall into traps in six months' time when the tax man comes looking on the door or you, uh, you get, you get a, a letter for, for some sort of um, legal strife that you didn't realise you've suddenly got yourself into. Awesome, awesome. Okay, um, if you are interested in how to build a business team, which is really that advisory team, maybe accountant, a lawyer, bookkeeper, um, your insurance broker, uh, Daniel and I did do a really great hub live on that last year. If you just look through the archives, you'll find us. Uh, we were still upstairs in my office on nice. a black coat. Mm -hmm. Yes, so we, we, there, is a, there is a session on that. Okay, and then there's another option again, which is to offshore. Yes. How does that work? We do this a lot. In actual fact, I've started with offshoring with um, development teams for software probably back in about mm, 2004. You've done everything. <laughs> you've, done, you've been doing everything for years, years and years. Does that mean I'm really old? I think, no, I, I think that's no, probably the No, no, you can't be really. No, no, Natalie, that's impossible. No, none of us, neither of us are really Business old. Business keeps you young. That's correct. Well. <laughs> New challenges keep you young. Correct. Okay, so... Um, and this, look, this plays very much into the part of um, also virtual teams because the key thing, when you don't have people coming into your office every day or you're not seeing them every day in the flesh, basically, there's always that concern about what are they doing. So um, the time management um, 
information that you would have got last month would have been particularly good around for what we need to do for virtual teams. If you're operating virtual teams, whether they be in a different city, they might still be in this country, they might be in other countries. At the moment, we've got a team in Pakistan, we've got one in Bangladesh, we've got one in Manila, and we've also got you know, people in the US. Plus, we've actually got another one in England. So we've got people essentially all around the globe. So how does that work? Well, the way that that works is by having some really good processes in, in, um, behind the scenes. So if you're offshoring to, say, a country such as Pakistan, um, India, um, Malay uh, Manila, Malaysia, oh sorry, Philippines, not Manila, you know, um, even to South America is becoming quite big with offshoring as well now, um, Brazil, Colombia. So what you have to do is look at the sorts of processes and look at the sorts of skills that these people have got and the sorts of jobs that they can actually do easily um, and to a high quality. These are not typically the sorts of jobs where they actually have to show a lot of initiative. It's more a case of saying, I need some design assets done. Here is the framework for our design. Here is the design specification. I need 10 Facebook posts that fit within that design spec built. Um, here is a design for a website, all done up. Please go and build that on a WordPress. Um, as a vi for, a, for a virtual assistant, they may be doing market research. Find me all of the venues across Australia that are of this size. So tasks like that are great to offshore. Accounting tasks are great to offshore. We've got our whole accounting team. Um, uh, so from a book pointing point, bookkeeping point of view, and from a customer service point of view, as long as they're not actually on the phone. If they're just doing chats and email support, great. Um, personally, I'm not one for having offshore phone support because I think that most people find those sorts of help desks um, a little bit, um, uh, there's, there's just a, a little stigma attached to that and you get some language issues. So look for teams or activities in your business that are those sorts of simple tasks that can be highly repeatable and can be offshore to people that have good skills. A lot of these people that, you know, in our teams have got masters in, say, IT, and they're highly capable, but their English may not be as good as we, we want. For example, mm -hmm. I would never give copywriting to um, any of our offshore teams. That's another service or, you know, with something that we would do in-house because um, connection through language is so, so important. And particularly when you're marketing globally, you have to have that language, uh, no barriers to language, and it needs to be very much in the language of the person that you're targeting. So the next thing comes to when you've got, how do you find these people? Well, there's some great sites out there, and this is, you know, I've, I found my tech lead for Pakistan on um, a system called Fiverr. I found him five years ago, and he's been my tech lead out of Pakistan ever since. Great guy, got a master's in IT, he even gets my jokes and he can type them out you know, really well. And I'm improving his English by making him actually do me videos. So he writes beautiful English and he totally gets English that way. Um, so we have a bit of a skills transfer as well. But he does a great job in doing all of my um, website development, Shopify, WordPress, that sort of stuff and leading a team over there. Um, that's how I found him. If you're part of Facebook groups, particularly global ones, I found a couple of my key people through global Facebook groups that I'm a member of. And you know, they'll just, somebody will say, hey, I'm a specialist in automation. And then you get chatting to them and they're in Bangladesh. Straight away, you know that you're gonna be paying a lot less. Mm -hmm. You know, typically you're gonna be paying probably in the vicinity of maybe $20 an hour for these sorts of people. Whereas this same skill set, you're gonna be paying, you know, potentially $100, $150 an hour for here. So these are the sorts of things that you've gotta weigh up. You can actually get VAs for virtual assistants for you know five dollars an hour. Mm. There's in offshore countries, so you've got to look at the activities that you need done, and where is the best use of resource, and where can you find high quality resource. Then after you've done that, you've got to be able to manage them. And okay, hold on. Can I just stop you? So, so the best place to find these people are. Facebook groups, so yeah. if someone isn't a member of Facebook groups, how do they go about finding the right Facebook groups to join? Well, first of all, I, I would typically join Facebook groups that you're associated with your industry, or if you have a particular skill or service, 
or just look through and sort of say, you know, offshore resources. There's so many different Facebook groups out there. There's sites like Fiverr and Upwork. Okay, so Fiverr, F-I-V-E-R-R.com. Yeah, yep. Fiverr. Upwork. Upwork. Um, there's design services out there where you pay monthly fees for design work, say Design Pickle. Um, you pay like $399, I think it is US, unfortunately, um, mm -hmm. with the exchange rate at the moment. But you can get a, pretty much a designer that's just going to pump out design work for you. There's plenty of cost-effective ways to get your business going um, without having to, um, you know, hire expensive resources when you only need them for a small piece. Or, and these sorts of offshore resources are often happy to work on a, on a per-piece basis, on a part-time or a full-time basis. Mm. And sometimes if you actually ask them, um, you can get them full-time for a fraction of what you think you might be able to. Yeah, but I think a really good tip is before you put them on full-time employment with you, do little projects. Exactly. Just Make check. sure you want them first. Yeah, check. Make sure they deliver. Work. Absolutely. Okay, so now we're building a virtual team. Maybe we're building multiples. So we have someone hired in-house. We have our advisors, our accountant, our lawyer. We also have some virtual help. How do we manage all of this team? Sure. Um, well, how do, how do I manage all of this team? I can, you know, speaking from experience, we use a product called Monday, which mm -hmm. is a really, really good uh, project management tool. And um, essentially, we have all of our tasks written uh, out in it. We have all of our, um, the associated people. And then it's great for being able to have a communication stream running about that particular task as well. We do things like we take videos and say, hey, we don't like this here, this, this, and this. Post that into there. Then our, one of our offshore people will pick that up, work on that, and then um, post back what they want. There's, um, the, the key thing when you're working with particularly overseas offshore staff is you have to be very, very specific about what you want and what you need. Don't leave things to be ambiguous at all. And if possible, give video diagram, you know, videos and actually, you know, screenshots, diagrams that they can work from. The more specific you are, the better results that you're going to get. Okay, so what technology do you use if you're going to make a video? And this is for your in-house staff or for your offshore staff. If you're going to make a video and leave an instruction or delegated task, what software can you use to um, record your audio as well as your screen? Okay, so the, t the tool that I use, um, it's a free or a paid version. It's called Vidyard, V-I-D-Y-A-R-D. And it's just a little extension that sits in like a Chrome browser. And anytime I have something there, I just hit the record button. I talk through what I want changed, use my mouse and sort of say, I don't like this or I want this or however, whatever the case is, create a little video. And then it, what it does is it allows you to have a shareable link. And then I just share that link into say my project management tool Monday and say, this is what I want. I use it for clients. I use it for tasking staff. I use it in, you know, in, in between other key members of staff. It's just easy and quick. Um, you've got to use technology to your advantage today. So if you can come up with a quick way of doing it on a video like that, and it takes you two or three minutes, rather than doing all screenshots, do it. Typing out an email, yeah, exactly. doing screenshots, do it. it'll take you an hour. Exactly. Really nice. Okay. Um, so monday.com, I think Chris yep. Rang mentioned Monday as well. Really, really Perfect great tool. project management tool. Really great. There are others, Trimble, Heaps. There's the, look, there's heaps of tools mm. out there. And look, I've probably used just about all of them. The thing I love about Monday is it's a combination between a project management tool, a spreadsheet, a collaboration tool, mm. and almost like a conversation channel tool and email. Mm. So I say to people now, don't send me an email if you want me to do something, put it in Monday because I've got a chance of getting it done there. Otherwise, it just gets lost in the, in the noise. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. That's awesome. Okay, so then what about um, managing a team around starting with your why and then building the right culture and then let's talk also, so those are three separate questions, also talk about, you know, actual uh, leadership slash management skills. But let's start with communicating the overall why to your team and getting them to buy in and see the direction and the goals and the targets and so forth. Mm -hmm. What do we do there? Yeah, look, um, having that why to start off with is really is a great thing because straight away, that should be, you know, inherent from when the person walks in on day one. Mm. Starting by, this is, or should actually even happen before then, because you know, as you're interviewing them, as you're putting um, 
um, your message out there to the world to say, hey, we're hiring, they should already be knowing the sorts of why that you're about and they should be attracted to that why. Um, so leading with that why is very, very important. And um, you want people that actually believe in it. You want people that you know, see it, smell it, taste it, just like you do, because they're the sorts of people that are going to carry you through the, the hard times because it's going to happen at the moment. I mean, mm. right now we're in the, in the brink of coronavirus uncertainty globally. And the people that you want now are people, that's a, that's a hardship for business. So the people that you want are going to be still people that are into the vision that can carry through and realise that you know things are going to get better, things are going to improve. We've just got to keep working forward. And how do we um, how do we collectively use our skills, our vision, and um, our abilities to overcome yet another challenge? Because it'll be coronavirus at the moment. It'll be something else later in the year. It just it's just the way business goes. Mm, that's and you fine. you want people that are dedicated to the mission. Okay, so then the why provides the overall like direction that you're moving into. And then do you set specific goals and targets for your team? Sure, you have um, specific goals and targets depending upon you know, what role they're playing, what business area they come from. If they're you know, online, they, they have a whole heap of online targets. It could be cost per acquisition, it could be click-through rates, it could be return on ad spend. For social media, it could be you know views, engagements, all sorts of things there. Sales, it could be um, you know the number of leads, the conversion rates. So it just depends very much on the individual role within the organisation as to what they're doing. Customer service, it could be the number of chats that they they are on per hour, the number of um, you know um, five out of five they get for resolving problems. Um, there are all sorts of metrics that would apply. But the key thing is for people is to be very clear and to make the, the, the targets that you're setting realistic, but just probably a little bit above to make them uh, a bit challenging because you don't want to be too easy, but by the same token, you don't want to set targets that are so unrealistic that people become disheartened before they even start. But every single person in the business needs to know when they're succeeding. Exactly. Right? They, they do. need to know this and you is need to, the target. And yeah. nothing works better than a little bit of praise and saying, Thanks so much for a job well done. Mm. And you actually, you achieved the target, it's measurable, it's achievable, and then also you brought a great attitude to work. That's yes, awesome. exactly. Yeah. And you know, little surprise things to, um, you know, when people do something really well that they don't expect. Mm. Um, it could be a massage, it could be a little gift hamper that just arrives mm. for them. It could be, a, you know, for an offshore person, it could be a, a, an Amazon voucher. Mm. These are all little things that don't cost very much to do, but just let people know that you appreciate the fact that they go that extra mile for you. Absolutely. And they're not expecting them either, so they're, even the, they're the, sort of the best sort of gifts. Yeah. Hey, Daniel, thank you so much for joining us. To hop on and ask a question for um, Natalie. Derek, I'm going to get to your question very, very shortly. So talk to us. Uh, so if we have our overall why and we've broken that down into goals and targets and every person in the business now knows what their target is, talk to us a little bit about team culture. How, do, how does team culture shape how we behave in the business? Yeah. And should that be written down? Like, What are your thoughts around team culture? Team culture is very much by leadership. It starts very much, you know, you need to, as a leader, you need to walk the walk that you want the business to be. If you're saying one thing and your behaviour is another thing, straight away mm. that's, in, you know, um, that's at odds with what people are seeing. So, mm. you know, if this is how you want your staff to behave, then you need to also be an absolute exponent for that sort of behaviour. And um, you'll find that as your teams get bigger, people will be unhappy. There'll be things that, you know, and it could be the fact that they're unhappy with something that's going on at work or the way something's being done. It could be the fact that they've got some sort of problem at home. As a leader and a manager, you know, it's up to you to, to tease out um, what those issues are and see where you can add support mm. and help. But by the same token, you'll probably find you'll get some hires that just don't fit. Maybe the company's growing so fast and things are changing so rapidly that some people don't fit. Um, you get, should get dissenters. You'll get people that like to play office politics. I have an absolute aversion to office politics. <laughs> I, have, I have basically had people removed from my projects for office politics. I won't cop it in any way, shape or form. To me, it's just, it's just nonsense that we don't need. You're either on the team or you're not. So you're either playing on the team or you're not. And they're the sort of people you want when things get hard because they're the people that are going to buckle down and really pull through for you. 
Um, because you know everybody knows a team is only as good as its weakest player, or it's a chain is only as good as its weakest link. Mm. So you, you have to think of those things when you are hiring. I mean, we do have some tools that can actually make things a little easier when you're actually going about hiring. For example, um, there are some great sort of personality profiling tools out there that you can get. And Elise, um, I'll give you some names of them that you can put in the, yeah, yeah, the yeah. comments yeah, yeah. afterwards mm. so that people can actually, because they won't remember it now. But um, one of the things is, is that if you start to do some of these little tests beforehand, before you either employ or while you've got a team there, people get to understand each other's strengths and weaknesses. Mm. And so therefore people will play, can start to play for people's strengths rather than their weaknesses. So, um, you know, Clifton Strengths Finder is a really good like that. It comes up with your top five strengths. There's about 34, I think. And, you, you know, you kind of know what you're going to be really good at. And that's great to know from you, yourself because uh, personal awareness really helps you shape your own behaviour. But it also helps with a team to know how people are likely to, to um, react. There's some other software I've worked with previously as well where um, not many people are aware, but when people are actually under pressure, often the role that they play within a team changes. Mm. So when they're under stress or pressure, they may be a leader that then reverts to a planner under stress. And having that insight into uh, how people respond and react is very valuable tools when you're putting teams together. Absolutely. You don't want the same person to be five people on the team because you're probably going to go five different ways if you've got the same person. Mm, that makes a lot of sense. Okay, just to bring that back to, um, so the recruitment, the personality profiling, I'm a great believer in that too. I don't think that you can really get to know someone in an interview. Yeah. You can't get to know their underlying behaviour just by asking them questions. They don't even know what their underlying behavior is often. So um, yeah, I, I absolutely am a big, big believer in personality and or behavioral profiling. But then to bring that back to culture, mm -hmm. um, I think it's, you, you mentioned when things go, when things get hard, the right kind of people pull through and get the job done. That is an example of great team culture. Mm -hmm. And if we write that down and we say in this team, we, when things get hard, we pull together and get the job done. That then becomes almost like the rules of the game, the way in which we behave when we come together as a team. And so if you have the culture and you ensure that the people that you recruit are the kind of people who can play that kind of game, again, you're just making things a little bit smoother and easier. Absolutely. And, you know, culture is one of the hardest things to define. It's also one of the hardest things to train because you really can't train it. No, it's you recruit it, it's, yeah. Yeah, it's inherent in people. Mm. And what you also find is, is that, you know, you get just a, a couple of people change in a team. It's a, it's a, think of it like a football team. You might have your grand final winning team this year. You change a couple of people out and suddenly that team goes from being the best team in the, the, the league this year and then next year it's, it's, you know, bottom of the ladder. And you think, how can that be? It's just that each person plays such a unique part, um, then it, it, it can change that rapidly. One thing that can really help to continue a great culture is processes mm. and technology that's, that's really aligned with what the, the business mission is. So if you can set up repeatable processes that are very clear, I see this a lot, um, I do a bit of consultancy in the US to large companies that are going through issues, and invariably, I can look back, you know, two or three years and I can see where processes broke down. Because when processes break down, that's when you start to get um, an acceleration of people resigning mm. and a big change in personnel. Mm. And then what happens is when people come in, instead of um, uh, basically adopting the process and moving forward, they start to do their own process. And so you used to end up with this splintering going on and nothing kills your culture quicker than that because suddenly you've got pressure from the top and because you're, you're not achieving your goals, you're not making your financial goals, there's then financial pressures and they're wondering, well, what happened? Well, fundamentally, the process and the people broke down somewhere and you've got to go back and figure out where that happened and then do some, you know, um, some triage mm -hmm. to get it back online. Mm. Okay, so let's talk about how to manage that from a leadership perspective. And Derek asked a really great question. What are the personal behaviors to avoid as business owners, founders, managers? 
my mind goes to the micromanager or the set and forget manager. What, what are your thoughts around what should we be avoiding when managing teams? Well, it depends upon, again, the sort of business that you're running. I've run a lot of businesses that have had very high-end staff. So my theory was I'm hiring very high-end people. They don't need me telling them how to do their job. They basically mm. just need me there to provide guidance and direction and you know, to solve problems as they come up with them. Chances are they're already going to have a solution for me. So it very much depends on the sort of business and the sort of level of people that you're dealing with. Typically people that are a higher level or a, a subject matter expert, they need very little management because they're already very um, au fait with what they need to do. Junior staff are a bit different. They're looking, they've often got lots of enthusiasm, but they have little experience. So it's about giving them a challenging enough job to keep them interested but not leaving them out to dry, so to speak. You have to be able to make sure that they don't slam into, um, in, in, they don't run into too, too big a trouble because that can be very daunting for a young person faced with the first real you know, problem that they, they get in business. Some people will just be resilient and overcome it, others won't. Um, with regard to, if you've got people that are in a team situation in the same building, one of the things that worked except, it works exceptionally well and you know, I've been a big exponent of it over the years, is um, managing by walking around. Mm. I used to have a very, uh, very busy job where I'd spend probably 90% of my time in meetings, but I'd always try and allow at least half an hour a day where I just walked around my team and just basically my job was just to te test the litmus or the, I used to call it my, my temperature test, just to see how everybody was feeling, what, what they were stressed about, and I'd just sort of, you know, cruise up to their desk and sort of say, so what's going on, you know, and have a chat because I got all of the details about whether they were stressed at home, whether there was a problem actually in what the work that they were doing, whether they had a process problem, and it just gave me such a great insight and then able to do something about helping those people. Yeah, absolutely. I love that, managing by walking around, and that's just and managing your time effectively so that but the, really that's the really important thing to do but it never is urgent until there's a crisis but if you do the important tasks you avoid the urgent crisis it's great to be visible too yeah because that gives you a connection to the team they know that you're going to be walking around sometime each day yeah. and if they feel comfortable to be able to say hey nat or hey elise um, i want to come to you with this mm. um then that's great you also see the hard workers yeah and you see the ones that aren't you know chipping in so much yeah. that you can figure out how to re-engage them or, you know, um, and that's another thing that sort of spring, springs to mind. Often people are in the wrong job. Mm, they're just in the wrong position. They, yeah, you just need to adjust. You just need to say, you would be yeah. so much better over here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and yeah. Um, you just have to observe those things and be aware that, you know, just because they're there now doesn't mean that you can't move them over here. Correct, correct. Natalie, I've absolutely loved talking to you. Can you believe... We're almost at the 45 minute oh mark. So I have more questions, but I'm thinking maybe we should call it a day. Thank you so much. What else do you have? Just a last bit of wisdom or insight around managing teams or anything technology wise that you can suggest we use to make this journey of managing teams a little bit easier? Yeah. Um, first of all, fundamentally, um, make sure you focus on your processes because they are going to hold your business together. And so particularly as you're growing, it's really, really important to get those um, processes right. Mm. Make sure that you're very clear about the sorts of people that you're looking for. You're clear on the job description. You're clear on what their skill sets are. And make sure you have the right technology to support them. Because as you expand a team, particularly globally, having good technology to enable that to happen will be the thing that um, is the difference between success and failure. And, um, you know, the other thing that I really say is just walk a mile in their shoes as well because, you know, we're all human and at the end of the day, um, you don't know what road that person's walking. Sure, you see them for this part of their life, but there's a whole other life out there that they're leading. So just be a little bit cognizant of that as well. Mm -mm -mm. Have a bit of empathy. Yeah. yeah. I want to make two comments on what you said. The first one is the processes and the technology to support the processes. I can't cannot agree more. We actually did a Hub Live around how to systemize your business again last year. It's one where I'm sitting on the couch on my own. We go through nine steps of systemizing a business and we tie everything that Natalie just mentioned together from we're starting with the, the vision or the why and then working our way through to where you have how to 
systems documented so that the processes are super solid. The second thing that I want to just mention is we've mentioned a heap of technology tools today. If you are new to the whole technology world, do not worry. It's really simple. And what I suggest is that you do two things. The first thing you do is let's say, for example, you want to have a go of using Fiverr. What I would suggest is Google the word Fiverr, fiverr.com. The website will come up. I think um, just since it's posted it in the link. So just click on the link. It'll take you to the website and have a little look around the website. But then then go to YouTube and simply search how to use Fiverr or how does Fiverr work and you'll find a stash of videos that'll take you through what to expect once you've registered on Fiverr. Everything step by step, here's where you click to register, here's what, how the payment works, here's how to engage someone, here's what to do and here's what not to do. So literally within a half an hour of watching a few simple YouTube videos, you could be very familiar with Fiverr and then literally chuck five dollars which is what the whole thing fiverr is a task for five dollars but i see that they're charging multiple five dollars now but chuck a little bit of money on a small project and just do a test or an experiment and then you can decide how you could use that tool so i highly 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 recommend that you investigate the tools that we've mentioned I use today it, yeah i've used it so much in the past little things that i've gone to do and i'm thinking this is going to take me an hour and a half it's not worth my time yeah I can find somebody in five minutes to go and do this and pay them ten, you know, five, ten dollars. Done. And there's really there's a there's a whole edu um, entertainment element to Fiverr as well. There, <laughs> yes. you can't believe what people would do for, for, a bit for of five dollars. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so so do yourself a, a favor. Uh, same with Upwork. Same with Monday.com. If you don't know how to use Monday.com. Hop on the website, just have a look around and then go to YouTube and YouTube, how does it work, what to do, and you'll find you'll find yourself very comfortable with how to move forward if you just have a little go. So embrace technology it's because your best it friend. is really there to help things. It will help. be your best friend it, for your business. It will. Once, you, once you're familiar with it, mm -hmm. once you're comfortable with it, which won't take a long time at all, no. it will be your best friend. Absolutely. Natalie, thank you so thank very you for much. Me. It's been wonderful. Um, this, uh, again, this Hub Live sponsored by the Turbo Traction Lab, which is why you're here. Yes. Thank you so much for all the work that you do. Oh, you're my doing pleasure. amazing work. It's such a privilege and a pleasure talking to you today. And we can't, help, can't wait to have you back. Oh, Hope you thank get you. come back soon. Thank you, everybody. Next week, one o'clock, Hub Live again. I look forward to seeing you then.